Hey kiddos, in today's video we're going to talk a little bit about the Northern Renaissance, a little bit about how it was different from the things that were going on down south in the Italian Renaissance, talk about a couple of the big name um, artists, and then I really think it's important to talk a little bit about the influential figures for the Northern Renaissance, and then we'll sort of wrap up um, by talking about some themes and maybe about what makes it different than the Italian Renaissance. Um, so the first artist that we're going to start with is uh, Jan van Eyck. Um, uh, he is especially um, well known for these incredibly detailed um, paintings. Um, one of the things that will make him a lot different than some of our Renaissance artists is that he's going to use oil paints. And so he's going to sort of have these, this uh, greater variation in color. And you can really see a lot of color contrast. Not that you couldn't see those in some of the Italian paintings. But, but using oil paintings instead of the tempura that was largely used by the Italian artists will allow for more detail and more variation in the color. Um, uh, Van Eyck in particular is known uh, especially for his intense focus on detail. Um, what, one thing that you'll probably notice is that the images are still going to seem a little bit flat and if you look at the time frame you can sort of see that this is, this is prior to like the, the sort of focus on perspective um, and anatomy that we see in the Italian Renaissance and so while things are incredibly detailed um, in some ways they don't seem as lifelike but what is very lifelike and is pretty characteristic of Northern Renaissance artists um, is this sort of like real world imagery, right? And so like if we look at Italian Renaissance art, we tend to see a lot of like sort of classical figures um, and like almost mythological type things and proportions. And a lot of the Northern Renaissance artists are going to, they're gonna do some of that as well, but they're certainly gonna have a, an intense focus on um, real world. And we're gonna see that um, later on when we talk about the Dutch Golden Age as well, because there's some real intense focus on like families. And you can see that here in the Arnolfini portrait here. Um, what is also very characteristic of both the Italian Renaissance, but perhaps even more so of the Northern Renaissance, um, is this intense focus on religious passion and intensity. And, and this is uh, maybe one of Van Eyck's great masterpieces. This is the Ghent altarpiece. It's essentially around the altar of a church in uh, Ghent. And you can really, I think, if you look at this, sort of see some of this transition that we mentioned before in the Italian Renaissance between Gothic and Renaissance times, because you definitely see these like, you know, more realistic images, more lifelike images, but then maybe you don't see quite as much um, perspective here as you might have in some of the uh, Renaissance paintings. There's definitely some of that, but but the focus obviously is is focused in a different um, way. Um, but just just absolutely tremendously uh, beautiful artwork here. Um, our next artist is Peter Bruegel the Elder, um, and I have a particular love for uh, Bruegel. I think that Bruegel more than and, and as a non-art person for myself. I think Bruegel, more than almost any other artist from this era, is someone that you can like pick out his stuff immediately and know what it is. Um, he he, uh, paint, he has these paintings that are showing the lives of ordinary people. So what's really unique here in children's games is first off, there, there's a ton of children. Like the focus of the, the painting is children. And, and remember that children don't really come into the sense of being like a separate class of people. Um, until a little bit later on in European society. And so to, to really focus in on children and sort of like just regular townsfolk peasant children um, is something really special. Um, a lot of times Bruegel actually has like sort of this like uh, not maybe subtle or not so subtle I guess um, sort of socio-political commentary and you can see this here in the, the fight between Carnival and Lent. And so you can sort of see this like you know differences in maybe some religious customs and how they're they're interacting there. Um, I certainly think, you know, if you're looking at Bruegel's uh, paintings, you can definitely see that there's obviously a lot of, um, they're, they're very busy, right? They're, all, they're very, very super crowded all the time. I, to me, they almost look like a, a, you know, a Renaissance version of a Where's Waldo. And I do not mean that as like an insult in any way, but like there are just so many figures packed into a lot of his paintings. That is certainly not true of all of his paintings. Um, he did a lot of landscapes as well that maybe have a few um, a few less people in them, um, but they're, they're still all have this like sort of very stylistic, um, you know, in, in, in some ways almost cartoony, but like the detail um, and, and just just sort of the, the reveling in the common people um, is pretty impressive in Bruegel's work. Um, Albrecht Durer is one of the big names in the Northern Renaissance. Um, he sort of, he initially gets a lot of following for his woodcuts. 
Um, and he's going to work in watercolors as well. But uh, Night, the Death, and the Devil here is is one of the just a, a really famous um, Northern Renaissance work. Um, and, and it's famous for, for several reasons. First off, there's just a ton of symbolism in it here. Obviously, the fact that you've got, you know, a, a medieval knight, and then you've got death, and you've got the devil here, and the devil's holding an hourglass, which, you know, is supposed to symbolize that life doesn't last very long, um, and those sorts of things. Um, that This sort of preoccupation with death is sort of a, a hallmark very often of a lot of northern, both northern renaissance and then even into the Dutch Golden Age um, works as well. Um, what's going to make Durer a little bit different than Bruegel and, and Van Eyck is that, that Durer was in pretty much constant communication with some really famous Italian Renaissance figures like da Vinci, like Raphael. Um, and so he, he is developing from them his views on anatomy and things like that. And, and you can see um, you know, that he's really worked out the detail and the anatomic structure of this horse. This isn't like a flat, you know, sort of almost mythological horse that you might see in a Gothic um, work. But instead, it's like a fully realized, realistic figure. Um, you can definitely see that realism in his self-portrait here. Um, Durer does a whole series of self-portraits, as many of the artists did at that time. Um, you can see like this just intense, um, you know, focus on detail. I, of course, am amazingly jealous of these locks, but you know, that, that's just me. I can't imagine why I'd feel that way. Um, again, you're going to see a lot of the religious um, themes and religious passion and intensity here um, in the Adoration of the Magi and in Adam and Eve. And again, you, you see that, like, if you look at Adam and Eve, you definitely see, like, yes, that looks somewhat similar to the Italian um, works that, you know, there's obviously, a, you know, a heightened focus on making things as realistic as possible. But then you look at something like the Adoration of the Magi here, and just, like, these these colors are just, like, out there, um, really intense. And so I think that that, um, you know, again, is going to be a hallmark of those different types of painting other than doing tempura. Um, that the that many of the Italian artists did. Um, our last artist that we're going to talk about here for this uh, particular video is Hans Holbein. Um, Holbein um, is really famous for doing portraits, particularly for portraits of famous people. Um, he gets a, well, we're going to see some more of him in the next couple of slides because he did the portraits of the gentleman that we'll talk about in the next couple of slides as well. Um, he's particularly famous for painting things for um, Henry VIII of England. Um, and in fact, sort of a, a, a cool like historical side thing here, he paints um, a, uh, a portrait of Anne of Cleves that sort of convinces Henry to marry her because he believes then that she is beautiful. When she actually, when they actually meet, um, they get married, but he's sort of so physically unattracted to her um, that he, he basically gets rid of her as well, which is kind of what Henry VIII did. He, of course, was a you know, generally terrible person. Um, so let's talk a little bit about a couple of guys who are really important for like the philosophical underpinnings of what the Northern Renaissance was about. Sometimes these two gentlemen that we're going to talk about don't get really talked about till the Reformation, um, and they're certainly important there as well. And we will definitely, you know, uh, talk about that. Um, but really, like if we're talking about the Renaissance and talking about humanism, um, there's probably no bigger name in humanism than that of Erasmus. Um, Erasmus is a priest. Um, but he's definitely a priest that believes that like you should you should take into account the needs of actual human beings and of the human co community and how human beings feel. Um, and, and so he really gets a lot of credit for being like the guy that really, you know, says, hey, you can be a Christian and be a humanist at the same time. Now, a lot of people might argue that today. A lot of people would equate humanism um, with secularism or maybe even atheism, but that certainly was not the case here during the Northern Renaissance. Um, he was a priest and he was definitely, um, though at the same time, not um, afraid to sort of um, both make fun of the church and then to call out um, significant abuses in the church. He was very often what we might term as anti-clerical, in other words, anti the clergy. Um, and he certainly does that in his most famous work, um, The Praise of Folly. He's gonna rail against abuses in the church um, but then when, when Luther sort of goes through the Reformation, Erasmus is very much against what Luther is doing. Erasmus thinks that the Catholic Church, yes, is the church. Um, he believes that uh, more people should have access. And so um, at the bidding of a publisher, he, he makes a new uh, or he makes a translation of the New Testament into Greek. Um, and then a separate version than just the Latin version that they'd been using for years, which was, the, of course, the Latin Vulgate. Um, in the uh, Adagia, he has a collection of Greek and Latin proverbs that's going to sort of 
just greatly influence our language. Things like a, a Rolling Stone gathers no moss. Um, think before you start throw, to throw cold water on something. Um, those are all sort of phrases, much like Shakespeare then becomes known um, years later um, for putting all these phrases in the English language. Erasmus also does very much similar things. Um, he's really sort of like the, whoops, uh -huh. he's really sort of the foremost um, of our uh, northern humanists, but really I think just humanism overall, I think he's like the guy as far as um, who you can look to as like one of the first real humanists. Um, Thomas More or Sir Thomas More or St. Thomas More, depending on, on where you're reading that from. Um, he's actually a friend of Erasmus. They know each other at the time. Um, he's a defender of the Catholic Church um, against the Reformation. Um, but at the same time, he was very much a humanist. He wrote a book called Utopia, um, and Utopia actually, if you put the um, words together, it actually meant nowhere. In other words, there's no such place as this. Um, and it, many people will assume that it's just sort of written as a social and political commentary. He's gonna attack a lot of problems with the church. Um, of note, the residents in Utopia, this fictional land that he creates, um, there's no private property, and so you can sort of see how influential that's gonna be later on to a whole wide array of, you know, sort of political and social revolutionaries. Um, some would say that he was writing it in a satirical bent. Um, and I think maybe, I, I certainly can't say whether or not that's true. I'm not a scholar of that. But but I would say that, that there might be some credence to that in the way that, that despite all of those things, all of this sort of attacks that he's making, he still very much believes in the Catholic Church. He believes in the Catholic Church so much that he dies for it. Um, he's actually um, Henry VIII's Chancellor of England, um, but when Henry VIII wants to divorce Catherine of Aragon to marry Anne Boleyn and get his marriage annulled, um, Thomas More says that's that's not legitimate, like you can't do that. And Henry's like, I'm going to do what I want to do, and of course we know that Henry is going to um, start the Anglican Church. Um, and Tom, uh, Thomas More says that I, I can't go along with that. He resigns a little bit before all that happens. And then eventually he gets executed for treason because he's not supporting Henry and his new wife um, in their new role. Um, so again, an important humanist, especially this idea, you know, what's in utopia here, this sort of different sort of society um, without this, this sort of traditional bounds of private property. So what are the main themes of the Northern Renaissance that we really need to focus on? Well, first off, there, it's similar to the, the Italian Renaissance in the sense that there's definitely a, a deep admiration for classical works. But, but what's classical in the sense of the Northern Renaissance sometimes is slightly different than it was in the Italian Renaissance. In the Italian Renaissance, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's classical Greek works of Plato and, and, and things like that. And for the, the Northern Renaissance, they're going to be much more into what we would call um, the, the patristic writings, the writings of the early church fathers, people like Eusebius um, and Origen and people like that. Um, and so they're going to spend a lot of time focusing on those in an effort sort of to like maybe revamp um, what they think being a Christian really should be. They're going to spend a lot of time focusing on biblical translations. Um, as you saw in the paintings, there's there's still some focus on Greek and Roman forms, but it's not the only focus. There's a lot more focus on like real life. Um, and in the Northern Renaissance, there's this really strong focus on education. Um, we'll see later as we see the development of Europe later on that sometimes there's sort of a divide between Northern and Southern Europe in those ways. Um, and I think some of that sort of maybe starts in the uh, Northern Renaissance times where they're going to spend a lot of time focusing on education. Erasmus is going to sort of try to shift them a little bit away from that, as we talked about before, that scholastic thought into obviously a more humanistic way of thinking of things. Um, and I just want to wrap up and say, despite the fact that there's, you know, this heavy emphasis on Christian humanism, this, this Christian humanism that sort of starts... Um, or at least it's sort of a branch off of the Italian Renaissance that maybe forms a little bit differently because it's coming from Erasmus um, in the Northern Renaissance is really part of what's going to allow secular Europe to become secular Europe where it's going to eventually reach a point where the religious things aren't what ties Europe together but rather maybe a geographical area and then a shared civilization, a shared history um, beyond that. And so I think that's a really important theme of the Northern Renaissance as well. Of course, guys, by, by no means is this an exhaustive list of, of the people that you ought to know in the, in the Northern Renaissance, um, but I think this is a good starting place, and these are definitely some names um, that you ought to know, and make sure that, you, of course, as always, that you know those themes. All right, thanks a lot.